So, Sony had a rough week. Uh, the Last of Us Factions has been cancelled, and hackers are holding Insomniac for ransom. We'll get into that today. Plus, Free Radical is unfortunately shutting down, and uh, E3 is officially dead. I mean, a lot happened this week. I wasn't expecting a lot to happen this week. Um, there's a live-action movie coming from Death Stranding, and apparently Alan Week 2 might be a flop after being such a dolly at the Game Awards. Uh, the Switch is inching closer to a huge milestone. Uh, Fallout 4 has been delayed, and my Xbox year in review. Uh, these stories and more tonight on the Console Wars podcast. <laughs> Okay, so first off, let's do some house cleaning. Um, we released our Godzilla Minus One review this week. If you're interested in that, go check that out. I'll leave the link in the description down below. Uh, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below on this video. I won't say that on any of our other videos, except the Console Wars podcast, because it's such a long-form video that's, you know, you're here for the duration, obviously. And then, again, don't forget to use the chapters down below to get to the segment you want to hear about, because obviously not everyone has around an hour to commit to a video these days, so I will be sure to include chapters. And then, real quick, if you guys have any questions about pop culture or video games you want to ask me, if they're interesting enough, I will have discuss them next week on the next episode of the Console Wars podcast, unless we don't do an episode next week. And then, real quick, I'll be sure to do some other mentions about this, but our hour play videos, where we do about an hour of gameplay, I am taking a break from those, simply because I have so much on my plate as it is. I'm not never doing those again and I will probably do ones for certain games that I think are special but for the most part I am going to cut back on them for the sequel future I will also mention this a few more times so that people are going where are they for the 12 on YouTube that actually watch them. Funny enough, I get a lot more views of those on Rumble than I do on YouTube, so I might continue on with those exclusively on Rumble. I'll just do a wait and see. But anyway, yeah, let's get into the first story. Um, The Last of Us multiplayer um, factions is no more. And uh, this article from uh, Push Square uh, is titled, The Last of Us Multiplayer Project is Officially Cancelled. Nidog will focus on single-player games. Nidog to has today shared the news. Its Last of Us Multiplayer Project has been officially cancelled. A post on the developer's official website states, We've made the incredibly difficult decision to stop development on that game. It continues, We know this news will be tough for many, especially our dedicated the Last of Us Factions community, who have been following our multiplayer ambitiously, ardently. How long have they been waiting to use that word? We were equally crushed at the studio as we were looking forward to putting it in your hands. It's then explained that the full scope of the project was only realized when it entered full production, to the point where the developer could only choose one of two paths. Become a solely live service game studio, or continue to focus on single player narrative games that have defined Nidog's heritage. The Uncharted studio has chosen the layout, and so its live service, The Last of Us game, is no more. We are immensely profound. We are immensely proud, sorry, of everyone at the studio that's touched this project. The learnings and investment in technology from this game will carry into how we develop projects, and will be invaluable in the direction we are heading as a studio. Nidog ends the post by confirming it has more than one ambitious brand new single player game in the works, and it cannot wait to share more about what comes next when we're ready. Uh, this represents another setback for Sony's push into live service space, as many of the mostly unannounced efforts have been delayed. 
Concord and Fair Games weren't met with much enthusiasm upon the release, and Bungie, the developer brought in to lead the platform holders, Live Service Center of Excellence, is doing worse than ever with layoffs and an unhappy community. Uh, so, yeah. Um, way I see it, this was inevitable. Like, <laughs> when the first Last of Us had its multiplayer, it was never meant to be the central focus. It was like, hey, let's throw in a quick multiplayer because multiplayer was all the rage. It's back in 2013. And not a lot of people were expecting much from it. And when it came out, people tried it. It's like, hey, you know what? This is actually kind of fun. And it had a dedicated fan base. And like Night Dog, it's like, oh, wow, people really took to this multiplayer that we just had kind of a crazy idea about. And so... This really, this cancellation, I kind of saw this coming when Jim Ryan was fired. I'm sorry, when he decided to step down. Uh, because that guy was rabidly obsessed with live service. Like, he, he wanted everything to be his Fortnite. Like, he saw Fortnite and he just his eyes turned to dollar signs. He's just like, I must have that. And so basically, his plan was like, we're going to make everything live service and it, it was driving the company into the ground uh so so many have been canceled so far i think the only reason why concord and fair games hasn't been canceled yet is simply because they've already been announced and i won't be surprised if those two games get canceled as it were because i've already been over the live service thing the people who are into live service have already been accounted for they're already with call of duty apex legends fortnite there's not any more life service people like man i'd love to get in a life service but just there's nothing out there for me there aren't really many of those people what few there are are not enough to keep something like this afloat and then also it, it, it's naughty dog their record is very tarnished since 2020 um they lost a lot of their fans after the whole last of us part two debacle and right now sony is clean house of all of the jim ryan rot that i can see they may put someone in who's just like oh no let's do all live service so i'm not saying that the next ceo is going to be our savior but um yeah, as it is right now, I think they are cutting a lot of the failed projects that Jim Ryan was implementing, and this was one. I mean, people were kind of intrigued if Last of Us Part Two was going to have a factions multiplayer, but having an entire contained project by itself, I don't know if The Last of Us had that many factions fans. I mean, maybe. Maybe they did. But Sony was looking at this as like the amount of money we'd have to put into this just to see if it'll stand us two feet, it, it, it's not worth it. So, yeah, they canceled it. But unfortunately, Sony's bad luck doesn't end there. Moving on, uh, this broke during the week Hackers Breach Insomniac Games. This is from Push Square. Um, Marvel's Wolverine details and employee data are up for ransom. Sony is currently investigating. I think this has since been confirmed that this hack is legitimate. Uh, it, so the article goes on to say, Insomniac Games, the PlayStation first-party studio behind the recent Marvel Spider-Man 2 and the upcoming Marvel's Wolverine has been hacked, with sensitive information currently held hostage in a brazen digital heist. Word comes to us from Cyber Daily, thanks Eurogamer, which reports that a ransomware group named Ricidia, Ricidia, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, is claiming responsibility for providing proof of hack documents. This includes details on the in development Wolverine, internal emails, files, personal documents like scans of employee passports, and who knows what else. One of the documents reportedly belongs to Spider-Man actor Yuri Lowenthal, who should probably change his passwords as soon as possible. Uh, Residia 
if that's their name, has set a seven-day deadline to pay the ransom before the group publishes its ill-gotten gains online. In case Sony doesn't want to play ball, Residia is putting the data up for auction, with the price starting at a pricely sum of 50 bitcoins worth around $2 million. Sony has published a statement, we are aware of reports that Insomniac Games has been the victim of cyber security attack. We are currently investigating the situation. We have no reason to believe that any of Sony Interactive Entertainment, I think that's what SIE means, or Sony divisions have been impacted. Uh, so, yeah. Then a leak kind of came out. I think this was the hacker group kind of showing that they have sensitive material. They leaked that a spy first game was in the works at Insomniac. Um, so that could be a guess. Insomniac has not confirmed this or denied it. At least that I have seen. Grant, I haven't looked too much into the Spider first game. I think a lot of people would be excited if that happened because like Spider Man Shadow Dimensions is a very beloved game and that was heavily involving the Spider first. And so, with this, I don't know. I mean, on one hand, Sony is probably treating this as do not pay the ransom or they're just going to hit us again, which I would agree is probably the smart move to do. But on the other end, do they really want to let the public know what they're working on and more specifically, what subversions they're working on, i.e. Insomniac has kind of become more and more kind of like Naughty Dog, where it's becoming more about a message and less about fun. With the Spider-Man 2 game, I was really looking forward to playing that, and then I found out that like they were just shoving all kinds of political message in, and then the one criticism from the first Spider-Man game that everyone had, I did not come across anyone in my walks that my walks that enjoyed the Mary Jane stealth missions and to hear the game director go we heard those and we basically decided to tell our audience go fuck yourselves and we decided to put even more Mary Jane missions and make her more of a focus in the game like when I heard that I was just kind of like I want to play a Spider-Man game I don't want to play a Mary Jane game and so I have no intention of getting Spider-Man 2 right now. Not because how dare they have a mission with Mary Jane in it. That's not it. I don't have a problem playing as Mary Jane. What I have a problem with is a game director who does not care about what the audience wants. I have a problem with a game director that hears the audience saying, hey, we didn't like this. And he just kind of like, yeah, go fuck yourself. I mean, watch the interview. That's kind of how his attitude was. And it's like, yeah, you know what? I don't need to buy your game. Uh, I got plenty of Spider-Man games, and it, it's not like I'm desperate for Spider-Man content. Uh, I still have Miles Morales, which I'm looking forward to playing. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah. And, like, I have literally no excitement for Wolverine now because, let's be honest, if it's the same people making Wolverine that are making Spider-Man, not so much the company, but the same individuals, they're going to have a bunch of stupid messaging in it, and there's going to have several levels where you're playing as Jubilee in stealth sequences, and not as, you know, the person whose name is on the marquee, Wolverine, and so, like, I lost all interest in Wolverine when that happened. And so with this kind of situation insomniac is already has a bad you know reactions from their fan base and who knows what they're working on i mean they could be working on a mary jane game solo game i mean if that comes out that they're working on that that's not going to go over well with the fan base uh they could be you know the, leaks could be revealed about how their next Spider-Man 
is just Spider-Man 3, and it's only about Miles Morales, and they kill Peter Parker, and, I mean, who knows what leaks these people have. I mean, look at the damage the leaks did to The Last of Us Part 2. I mean, and look at the damage Naughty Dog caused themselves on how they handled the leaks to The Last of Us Part 2. The same thing could happen here. I mean, this is a potential powder cake. If this ransomware company or hacker group leaks sensitive information that are as polarizing as the leaks from The Last of Us Part 2, you're looking at another 2020 all over again with how they react. And you have people talking about the leaks and then they'll start filing um, DMCA strikes against people for just talking about it, which you are legally allowed to do. If you don't believe me, every single person who had a strike la la labeled or lodged against them on YouTube against talking about Last of Us Part Two won their appeal. I cannot find one person who lost their appeal. So just consider that when you want to go, oh, no, it's not legal to talk about something in the wild. No, if sensitive information comes out into the public, like, hey, Insomniac is working on a Star Wars game, and that was leaked, the person who leaked it is liable. But I can talk about it all day, and I'm legally allowed to do it, because it's out in the open. That's why NDAs are so crucial, okay? It's to prevent that from happening. And so... I totally see Insomniac pulling the same nonsense if this stuff does get leaked. So part of me is like, Sony, don't pay. But no, part of me is like, dude, if you don't want the public to know about this information, maybe you should think about paying. Personally, I wouldn't pay, but at the same time, I wouldn't be ashamed about anything I was getting ready to release to the public. So... Moving on, I've spent too much time on this. On a subject, something that is bleak is Free Radical is shutting down. And this was kind of the writing on the wall when the Embracer, Embracer group? Yeah, the Embracer group was starting to sh cut its studios when they didn't get that $2 billion deal. Basically, Embracer bought up so many game suits. They bought up enough game studios where they could have, if they had the money, created their own console and had enough game studios making exclusive games where they wouldn't need any third-party game developers releasing stuff on their console. That's how many game developers they had. Like, I talked about this a while back on a video titled, Who Could Make the Next Gaming Console Apart From The Big Three? And, like, one of the big ones I was considering was Embracer Group because they had enough studios that their numbers dwarfed Xbox and PlayStation combined. That's how many studios that had. And unfortunately, what it turned out to be was Embracer just bought up all these studios and then they tried getting a deal with like a Saudi Arabian a financial firm for two billion dollars which would have given them the funds to make games and they backed out of it the last minute because of something they didn't like and embracer had to go you know belly up on a lot of these studios to try and save themselves and so they shut down you know volition studios they shut down a couple of those and now they're shutting down free radical and it's unfortunate because when they bought free radical they were saying hey guys we're looking at doing a new time splitters. And it was kind of a smart move because they were talking about having time splitters, bringing back time splitters. They were talking about bringing back um, Blood Omen, the Soul Reaver series, because they bought the studio that originally made those. They're making a new Tomb Raider. And so it was kind of exciting to see what Embracer was going to do, but unfortunately, they flew too close to the sun. And so now Free Radical is shutting down. This article is over from uh, Pure Xbox. Free Radical Dev says farewell as Time Slow Studios gets shut down. Made good memories and experience. Farewell. Um, 
about two and a half years ago, the team behind Time Splitters was brought back to life by Embracer Group, but it isn't going to get to release its new entry in the classic first-person shooter franchise after all. Just like the rumors said last month, Free Radical Design is shutting down. The company's website now displays a rather sad image containing the message 404 Company Not Found. While it hasn't put an official statement out at the time of writing, some of the team's developers have begun posting about the closure. One dev says it's been a great two and a quarter years at Free Radical Design, but they're sad to see us go. While another employee is grateful for the good memories and experience gained since 2021's Free Radical Revival. And um, yeah, this is unfortunate because I constantly see online people talking about how Time Splitters, Time Splitters 2, and Time Splitters Future Perfect are like some of the greatest first person shooters ever. And I have Time Splitters 2 and Future uh, Future Perfect or Future Imperfect. Anyway, I have 2 and 3. And um, it's unfortunate that this studio is getting shut down because... Um, I know a lot of people were looking forward to seeing that franchise brought back, and it's unfortunate. that That's one of the biggest issues whenever you see a major studio buy a development firm is there's a good chance they make it shut down. The only company that hasn't started doing that yet is Xbox, thankfully, because, I mean, like, Xbox just bought a bunch of studios. I hope they stop because... Like, I'd like to see some of the studios they bought start putting out stuff. And, like, we're just now starting to see the 2018 acquisitions with Bethesda. We haven't seen any Bethesda games as of yet that have been developed under Xbox's Overwatch. Yeah, there's going to be the Starfield fans saying, Ooh, what about Starfield? Starfield was already in development long before Bethesda was bought by Xbox. So technically, Starfield doesn't count. I'm waiting to see when the studios they've bought have started putting out stuff. Because if Xbox just keeps buying stuff and you're not seeing anything released, then yeah, that that's not a good financial decision and so i mean it's sad to see friday free radical go i hope we don't see this with additional studios um maybe we should go back to a time when studios only had two-year development cycles instead of you know seven <laughs> you know? <laughs> so moving on to other sad news e3 is officially dead uh yeah that that's pretty much the title of this article from Push Square. E3 is officially dead. Game over. Uh, the Electronics Entertainment Expo, better known as E3, is officially dead. A statement on the official website simply reads, After more than two decades of E3, each one bigger than the last, the time has come to say goodbye. Thanks for the memories. In a report by the Washington Post, the Entertainment Software Association, which organized E3 each year, has confirmed the exhibition won't be coming back. President and CEO of ESA, Stanley Pierre Luis, shared the news that the show is coming to a close. After more than two decades of hosting an event that has served as a central showcase for the U.S. and global video game industry. E3 began in 1995 and has been a mainstay sorry, in the gaming industry's calendar. It started purely as an event for publishers and developers to market their games to retail buyers and the press, but was eventually made for more public-facing and invited fans to the showroom floor too. With increasingly larger and more expensive press conferences from the likes of Sony, Microsoft, and Ubisoft, it slowly became too big to properly please industry pundits and fans. After the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020, E3 has failed to make a meaningful return to form. In the last few years, new competitors have emerged and major publishers have handled their own presentations themselves. The writing has been on the wall for a while, but now the show is officially done. We know the entire industry, players and creators alike, have a lot of passion for E3. We share that passion, said Pierre. We know it's difficult to say goodbye to such a beloved event, but it's the right thing to do given the new opportunities our industry has to reach fans and partners. 
It's definitely a shame to see E3 shut down completely, even though it's fall to Lyle years. It's an iconic part of the games industry and has played host to some incredibly memorable moments, both good and bad. It was a dinosaur, but we're absolutely still miss it. So, I saw this coming. I think a lot of people saw it coming. And technically, I think E3 started to die a lot earlier than people said it was starting to die. I kind of saw the beginning and the end to be 2012. Because E3, I won't say always was this, but somewhere in the early 2000s to 2012, E3 started to cater to more the male audience than it did the female audience. Because at that time... You didn't have the female numbers that you do now. Uh, I think it's like 45 to 49% of gamers are now female. And back when E3 entered the early 2000s, it was like 95% male. So considerable <laughs> shortening of the curve from that time. But during this time... They did something crude and a little tasteless, but it was a huge success among the gamers was the scowling clad women at the uh, showcases. Basically, you had women wearing tight tops and short shorts where their top said the name of the game they were promoting, and they basically just hand out, you know, little tiny posters and keychains to the normies walking around on the showroom floor. And, you know, it was kind of cool for us guys because we were seeing women that we would have never been able to have gotten showing an interest in video games and it leads to one of the i feel the biggest lies in gaming that most male gamers are sexist no talk to any male gamer at gamestop what their ideal date is with a girl they're going to say, yeah, Saturday night, sitting on a couch next to a hot girl playing video games. So, like, this idea that most male gamers don't want women playing video games is, like, one of the biggest lies in this industry. Uh, I stand by that statement for anyone who wants to criticize me for that. <laughs> now, yes, I will acknowledge. Once we start getting more female gamers, that... that probably wasn't going to last and no i don't think that's what killed e3 that was just kind of like the beginning of the loss of interest i mean after 2012 you still saw the big conference blowouts but the enthusiasm wasn't quite there like it was in 07 08 09 010 i mean like those were like the golden years of e3 and I think the really big beginning of the end was not COVID. It was 2018 because Sony did their press conference and they got heavily criticized for like not showing enough. And it was in like this weird venue and it turned out they paid millions of dollars just to set up that venue. And they said, you know what? It's that blowing millions of dollars at E3 Let's just do our own thing that we'll, you know, live stream. And it won't cost us millions of dollars. And so they decided to back out of E3. And Nintendo and Microsoft kept it going for, like, another two to three years. And then COVID hit. And COVID was kind of like the final nail in the coffin. And, yeah, the people at E3, they really tried to bring it back, but... Microsoft, they saw the wisdom of just doing their own productions. They could create a smaller stage. They don't have to worry about security. They can just live stream it. Nintendo went nuts with the Nintendo Directs, and they never looked back. And so without the big three, you were going to have a couple of small publishers, you know, show up. And that wouldn't have been enough to justify the enormous cost of putting this thing together. And so, yeah, I mean... I think E3 was dying when Sony left, and then COVID just killed it. So, I mean, 
It'll be sad to see it go because E3, unlike the Game Awards, did actually have really big reveals. And like the Game Awards, yes, the Game Awards do have big reveals, but they got a lot of tiny indie stuff that just does not appeal to me. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, you know, times change. It, it's a it's a new age, and uh, yeah, let's move on. So apparently, there's going to be a Death Stranding movie. And uh, it's going to be made by A24. And, uh, like, they're starting to sell a t-shirt showing the A24 logo with, like, the Death Stranding font. And so, I don't know how I feel about this. Like, I'm not the huge diehard fan of A24 like a lot of people are. There, there are people out there. If they see that A24 at the beginning, like... No offense, but they kind of like start start playing with themselves sexually. I mean, you know, trying to keep it a little clean, but I mean, it's like I kind of feel like doing this anytime I hear someone talk about A twenty four because it's like I kind of feel like A twenty four is a little full of themselves. Um, I'm not saying that they make nothing but crap. I'm not going to say that, but just. I'm not as enamored with A24 like a lot of people are. Like, there's people, they don't care what it is. If they see that three digits in a movie, it's like, it's automatically in their top ten list of best movies of the year. No matter how boring the movie is. So, I'm not saying that this movie is going to be completely junk because it's being made by A24. It's just, A24 does not excite me like it does some people. And with Death Stranding, one of the issues is that is a very convoluted plot that they explain a lot of their convolutedness, if that's even a word, I don't think it's a word, through text files. Endless, endless text files. And so... With as convoluted a plot as Death Stranding is, I don't know if A24 is going to be able to explain it all in a two-hour movie. I don't even know if they can explain it all in a three-hour movie. Now, will the movie be visually stunning? Absolutely. But also, is this movie going to follow the plot to Death Stranding? I don't know. Because... A lot of stuff happens in that game. Like, to try and make that would be like a $300 million movie. And uh, I don't think they're going to use the guys who made the creator or Godzilla Minus Zero to work on the budget. So it's going to be an expensive movie. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're still years away from this film adaptation. And uh, I'm not going I'm not going to say it's going to be junk yet. I mean, the trailer could surprise me. It'd be cool if they got Norman's Re Norman Reedus and all of the actors back to do it. If they got uh, Mads Mikkelsen, um, Leah Sado, I think is her name, and uh, hell, even Guillermo del Toro to play his part. I, I think that'd be interesting if they got the actors back and just do a live-action version of the premise. And it'd be easy to cut the story down because most of the story is just you delivering packages. So if they just adapted the cutscenes, then I don't know, maybe they could pull off a movie. So I'll be interested to see a trailer. Hopefully they'll make the trailers as fucking cryptic as the game trailers were. Like, seriously, I would watch the game trailers for Death Stranding over and over again, not because I am such a huge Kojima fan. I think Kojima is a little overrated, actually. I watch them over and over again just trying to figure out what the plot might be. It's like, okay, I'm seeing a whale with black oil coming out of it. This guy has an umbilical cord coming out of his gut to a baby. And there's a skeleton guy with a machine gun, like, doing the whisper thing. And these creatures are coming up on the ground. There's floating people and floating babies. And the ground's black water and... Did someone give me drugs? Like, <laughs> that's how a Kojima game feels. It feels like 
this is the best way to experience drugs without taking drugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, hopefully the trailers aren't as cryptic as the game trailers are. So, in other news, Alan Wake 2 has been widely raved as, you know, like the greatest game of the year, and it won a few awards at the Game Awards, and, um, but the weird thing is, apparently, Alan Wake 2 might be a bomb? Uh, this is from, uh, Push Square. Critical Darling, Alan Wake 2 sales seem soft, but there's more to the story. And this is them trying to, you know, cover for them. Obviously, because Push Square is a huge fan of this game. But Remedy Entertainment's Alan Wake 2 received widespread acclaim, which is true, from fans and critics when it launched on the 27th of October. Continuing the tale of the tortured titular writer, the sequel to the cult classic Alan Wake, buoyed by more than a decade of hype and development by Remedy, with the momentum of well-received control behind it. You expect the game to sell like Game Busters, wouldn't you? IGN reports that Alan Wake 2's seemingly dire sales predicament doesn't paint the whole picture, citing the latest Circana for only NPD Group industry sales figures. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, Spider-Man 2, and Hogwarts Legacy claim the top three spots for November. Alan Wake 2 was conspicuously absent from the top 20. Yikes. Now, there are a few things to note. This is them trying to cover, you know, Remedies asks, Sarkana data doesn't account for digital sales that unless the publisher chooses to supply it. Epic Games does not. Remedy opted for a digital-only release for Alan Wake 2, which means no physical figures. Sarkana analyst Matt Pitscatella did confirm to IGN that Alan Wake 2 ranked 115th on PlayStation in terms of MAUs, monthly active users, in November, but still doesn't give us much to go on. And Pierre analysts, Pierre's Harding Rolls, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sorry, offers something more concrete, estimating that Alan Wake 2 managed 850,000 sales across consoles by the end of November. We wouldn't expect PC players to account for as many, an Epic Store exclusive, Steam users hate booing up campaign launchers. Rolls noted that interest will increase as the price drops. That is true. Control, a new IP for Remedy, managed to move 2 million units in its first year, famously developed on a modest budget of just 30 million. Alan Wake 2's budget is estimated to be more than double that, including marketing, making the games Finland's most expensive cultural product. Yikes. Uh... So, yes, it did hurt it that it didn't have physical sales. Yes, some of the writing complaints have hurt it from people. Like, I, I watched a video where people were showing scenes from the game. Like, some of the atrocious writing. It's just like... I expected better. Because some of the dialogue just is really bad and so i kind of like just held off it because one i don't feel like paying 60 bucks for a digital game <laughs> or 70 bucks for a digital game and uh also i haven't played the first one yet i have the first one i haven't played it i have played uh quantum break and i enjoyed that and i do have control as well so but i mean one thing that did kind of turn me off was the fact that it's not, you don't really play as Alan Wake in this game. Like, you only play for him like a fourth of the game, and you play as someone else for most of the game. It's like, this is the Spider Man issue all over again. I want to play as the person whose name is on the freaking box, okay? So, I think a lot of people heard that. And didn't buy it simply because it's like, why would I get a game called Alan Wake 2 where I'm not playing as Alan Wake? Okay, I want it, you know, if it was just called the dreamscape of madness, then fine. And Alan Wake is a guest character, I think you would have a lot less pushback on this game. But when you got a game titled, oh, I don't know, Superman, and you play most of the game playing as, 
Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane, no one's going to buy it. Okay, you have a game titled Spider Man, and most of the game you're playing is Miles Morales and Mary Jane. Yeah, you're going to have people tune out. When you have a game called Halo, and most of the game you're not playing is Master Chief, you're going to have people tune out. And so, I think that might be accounting for some of the weak sales. I mean, that one firm claimed that only 850,000 sales were made across consoles. That's that's not good. Okay, that that's pretty bad. Now, granted, they don't have all the digital sales, but I mean, they did account for active users on PlayStation, and so th that that's not good either. So I mean, it'll be interesting to see what the final sales numbers come out turn out to be. I mean, this could be a nothing burger. It could be that actually its sales are fine. I'm inclined to think that maybe its sales are struggling a bit because the no physical release, I think, really hurt them. And a lot of people like to claim that, oh, no one plays physical anymore. That is a crock of crap, okay? So many people still play physical games. <laughs> that is Sony and Xbox trying to convince people that no one plays physical because they want all the games to be digital only. So, so in some slightly happier news, the Nintendo Switch has surpassed the Xbox 360 in lifetimes U.S. unit sales. Uh, this over from uh, Nintendo Life. I keep forgetting the site's name. Nintendo Switch Lifetime US unit sales surpasses Xbox 360. Switch trails only Nintendo DS and PlayStation 2. Uh, Nintendo Switch has smashed all sorts of records in 2023, and it turns out it's just done again in recent times. It's highlighted by Circana, who's been brought up again. The hybrid hardware manages to managed to surpass lifetime U.S. unit sales of the Microsoft's Xbox 360 in November, making it the third best-selling system since MPD began tracking data. No sales figures have been shared. As noted by P Piscatella, uh, the Switch now only trails behind Nintendo DS and Sony's insanely popular home console, the PlayStation 2. The sales update in the U.S. follows on for Nintendo's Q2 FY 2024 financial report last month, with the company revealing sales in the first half of the current fiscal year were the largest since the launch of the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo revealed how it was due to increase in sales of its decade video games platform business, as well as a rise in mobile and IP-related income which include revenue across associated with the Super Mario Bros. movie. Nintendo also released games like Zelda Tales of the Kingdom and Super Mario Bros. Wonder in 2023. As of September 30th, the Switch has now sold more than 132 million units worldwide, placing it ahead of the lifetime sales of the Wii. The system also toppled the Wii's lifetime sales in the U.S. earlier this year. Real quick, let me pull up. List of best selling game consoles. Let's look at where the numbers are right now. Okay, so at number one is the PlayStation 2 at 155 million units sold. That you can account for the DVD player. If you're too young to remember, back in the early 2000s when DVD came out, it was ridiculously expensive. There were DVD players going for a thousand bucks. More modest ones at stores were like 700 bucks, 500. I mean, getting a DVD player was not cheap. And then here comes the PlayStation 2 at like 299 bucks. It might have been 399. And you had this brand new game system that had DVD player in it. It's just like so many people just grab that simply because they want a DVD player. And I hear that the PlayStation 2 DVD player is excellent. Like, to this day, it's still an excellent DVD player. And so that one makes sense. The Nintendo DS is at number 2 with 154.2 million units sold. Like, that thing got so close to becoming the highest grossing 
game system or highest number count units sold game system of all time. It just missed it by what a million, not even a million, like. 800,000 units. I'm amazed they didn't push it a little bit longer just to beat it. And then number three is the Nintendo Switch. And that has sold 132.46 million units. So it still kind of has a ways to go to reach the numbers of the DS or the PlayStation 2. But if Nintendo keeps up and doesn't announce a Switch 2 next year in 2024. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe they can reach that 155. Um, the, the Game Boy and Game Boy Color comes in behind them at 118. And then it's the PlayStation 4 at 117. Awesome console. Probably. I'd say probably PlayStation 4 is like my favorite console of all time. <laughs> And then the PlayStation, and then the Wii. The Wii was at 101 million units sold. And the Xbox 360 only sold 84 million. So the Nintendo Switch far surpassed that in worldwide sales. It only recently surpassed it in US sales. And so, can the Switch beat the DS and the PlayStation 2? I'm inclined to say no. Simply because they're at 132 right now. They are at the 150 range, and there's talks of a Switch 2 coming out next year. So, if they announce a Switch 2 next year, I think the answer is no. If they don't announce a Switch 2 next year, come back, and I might change my answer to yes, they could surpass it. So, wait and see. And then the last story for the night is uh, Bethesda finally brought up the Fallout 4 next-gen update or the current-gen update because now, like, PS4 and Xbox One are last-gen. Real quick, mention in the comments down below, when does current-gen become last-gen and next-gen become current-gen? I don't know. I don't know when the exact time is that happens. So, put your comments down in the comments below <laughs> on that issue. But uh, they finally brought up the Fallout 4 current gen, or the next gen update. I'm just going to call it next gen update. And they said that we need a bit more time. It's coming out in 2024. And uh, they released a message um, saying, Thank you for your patience with us as we work on the Fallout 4 next gen update. We know you're excited, and so are we. But we need a bit more time and look forward to an exciting return in the Commonwealth in 2024. So, I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. They're going to release this in April when the Fallout TV series comes out. <laughs> like, hands down. If they do not release this in April when the Fallout TV series comes out, someone's getting fired. Because that is the easiest non-intelligent move you can make with this brand. Okay? You have a brand new TV series coming out on Amazon that looks good, has a lot of anticipation to it. Why would you not release the next-gen version of that game when that comes out? And then ha have like an ad play before each episode. Fallout 4 is now available on PS5 and Series X. Like, that is a no-brainer. Okay, so seriously, if they do not announce that it's going to be coming out in April of next year, yeah, people are just going to go, what's wrong with you? Okay, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that's about it. I mean, you know, it's been delayed for next year. A lot of people were expecting that. And uh, I don't think anyone's really upset about that. It's like, hey, take as much time as you need. But if you don't announce it during the Fallout TV series, or if you don't release it during the Fallout TV series, you're an idiot. <laughs> so real quick, just kind of a fun little thing. Microsoft has rolled out their 2023 year in review to all of their users that play on their systems. And uh, Sony also does this as well. Each year, 
just they haven't released theirs yet. And I'll do my Sony one with theirs. And if Nintendo releases one, I don't know if Nintendo does, but if they do theirs, I will also post that as well. But I just thought this was kind of fun. It's nothing really important. And real quick, before I show you this, if you're thinking like, oh, I'm going to add him as a friend on Microsoft and maybe play some games here. I don't play multiplayer games because my internet is not sufficient enough to play multiplayer games. So just keep that in mind. If you throw me a, you know, e friend request on the Xbox uh, ecosystem. But uh, here it is, uh, my year in review 2023. And um, I don't know, that's just my lifetime gamer score. And then... My 2023 highlights. I have spent over 344 hours playing. A uh, little shame to say that out loud. <laughs> uh, I know there are some gamers like, dude, 344 hours is nothing. You're right. For certain gamers, 344 hours is nothing. For me, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, total games I've played, 67. Like to point out, most of those I got in sales where they were like two and three bucks a pop, so I'm not made money. <laughs> uh, total game of score I've made in a year is 4,115 game of score points. I've accomplished over 224 total achievements, and uh, I don't know if that's how many reward points. I don't really care about reward plates. Top gameplay month was September. I think you can guess what game that was. <laughs> Top genres you've played. 47% action and adventure. I, I like I like action. That's my favorite game genre. 35% is shooter action. Okay. 15% is role playing. Um you'll see what that one is. <laughs> 1% racing and flying. Um that was me dabbling with uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, which I got physically for 20 bucks at a time when it was like only 60. And even now, like seeing it stores, I see it for like 40 and 50. It's like, I can't believe I got that for 20 bucks. <laughs> and then 2% other. Okay. And then down, you see a list of games I've played Forza Horizon 5, which again, I grabbed that for 20 bucks, um, which I couldn't believe I got that. Halo Infinite. Uh, Mass Effect Legendary Edition, Starfield, uh, Starlink Battle for Atlas. I got a good deal on that one. And then Friday the 13th, the game. I grabbed that one for four bucks. And I grabbed it before they discontinued it. I don't know if they're still selling it. I don't think it's available anymore. You have to get it physically now. The number one most played game I did was Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Now, in all fairness, that was because it had all three games, and I played through the entire trilogy uh, this summer. So, uh, 100 hours with that, uh, 2,220 gamer score points with that, 96 achievements, and the rarest achievement was the Sky High achievement. I don't know what that was. And then the next game I played was Halo Infinite. Um, that was mostly during last winter when my internet wasn't cutting out so frequently. I was able to get like one multiplayer match in before I got knocked out of the second one. And it was this ridiculous thing. I had to jump through hoops to just enjoy the free multiplayer on that. Which I like that it's free multiplayer. But I don't like my internet. Again, if you're thinking about like throwing me a request on the Xbox ecosystem... I almost never play multiplayer games. So if you heard, oh, he plays Halo Infinite. Yeah, no, I, I rarely play it because I, I get disconnected constantly. And then the third top game I played was Starfield. I played about 49 hours of it. I still have a lot more to do on Starfield. I actually have a video coming up soon on the biggest missed opportunity I saw in Starfield. And then eventually I am going to do a review on Starfield. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about it for my year in review of, uh, my time on Xbox. And so, um, what were some of your 2023 highlights with your year in review? Uh, were you guys, uh, did you guys play those games or did you guys do other games instead? Uh, 
yeah, let me know in the comments down below. And so, yeah, that is pretty much it for this week's episode of uh, the Console Wars podcast. Uh, remember to throw down the questions you have for me in the comments down below. If they're interesting enough, I'll answer them next week. Um, during that week's episode of the Console Wars podcast. And then this upcoming week, I believe we are working on... We're going to start working on the best and worst movies of the year. So if you're interested in my thoughts on that, go check that out. And uh, yeah, that's been this week's episode of the Console Wars podcast. What do you think of the stories we talked about this week? My name is Chris Ricano with Lemonary Reviews. And that will be all for today.